After Arsenal's European tour saw them leave Lisbon with a 2-2 draw, the attention returns to the title race. As Arsenal take on Marco Silva's tricky Fulham, today we'll get all of the latest. From the potential availability of Gabriel Jesus to a move for Alexis McAllister, we'll also find out if Arsenal are favourites of Victor Ossiman and get all of the team news ahead of our massive match against Fulham. Yo, what is going on guys? My name is Bav14. Welcome back to your boys channel and so much has happened. We've got so much to discuss. So as per, smash a like if you've enjoyed, subscribe to the channel if you are new and help your boy on his road to 200,000 subscribers. The starting off with what we learned from Sporting Lisbon to Arsenal 2. Arsenal's European tour was back on after four months of waiting, the round of 16 in the Europa League and Sporting Lisbon away was always going to be difficult. They have got a manager in Ruben Amarin who is a top class young coach. Let's Let's not forget they dropped down for the Champions League. This game was made difficult and it was a battle. 2-2 on the day and the XG shows it was fair. Sporting Lisbon 2.09 and Arsenal 2.05. The first thing we need to talk about is the rusty Arsenal squad depth. In came Matt Turner and Jakob Kivior making his Arsenal debut and both could have been seen at fault for the first Arsenal goal. Yet another goal from a corner. We have now conceded in back-to-back -back games. I've seen a lot of blame go towards Jakob Kivior and him potentially ducking but for me this is all about Matt Turner. That is the area of a goal keeper where he needs to command and after watching back on the replay you can even see him calling for the ball which is potentially why Kivior left it. He looked very rusty and you know what I can't say I'm surprised. His first Arsenal appearance is January. I can somewhat understand his lack of game sharpness. In terms of corners Arsenal need to improve. Let's not forget the last season at one stage. Arsenal had faced 119 corners and conceded zero. Arsenal have shown they can defend corners but recently we've been caught sleeping. The Arsenal players need to wake up because we can't keep conceding such easy goals. The overall stats show that once again Arsenal had a lot of control. 67% of the ball, 675 passes completed, 66 final third entries and a 4.0 expected threat created. The field tilt as is to be expected shows Arsenal dominance, 73% in total. Arsenal fans are getting used to seeing these sorts of numbers because Arsenal are very good at keeping the ball in the final third. My issue is what Arsenal are doing in the final third. They've got a very clear method of chance creation and this graphic sums it up. Arsenal are the highest team in the Premier League in terms of chances created from cutbacks. 40 seven in total but we've only scored five in comparison man city have scored 10 with the amount of ball that arsenal have in the final third we need to be more decisive there was also a lot of defensive concerns constantly in this game the sporting lisbon players running in behind were causing arsenal issues the likes of zinchenko weren't at their best he seemed rattled and emotional especially after the fight during the celebrations of the first arsenal goal at one nil arsenal had this game in their control but they surrendered it playing out of the back we were making way too many mistakes and that's where arsenal need to learn variation no when to play short but also when to go long. But there was a standout performer and that was the Arsenal centre-back William Saliba. Winning 100% of his aerial duels, 91% of his passes, 4 duels won, 4 clearances, 4 accurate long balls, 1 shot and a goal. His third goal of the season. Without his normal partner in Gabriel, Saliba was still very impressive and he took control of the Arsenal defence. He's dominant in both boxes but sometimes that calmness can get him into trouble and that's where he needs to learn when to be no nonsense. In this game there was also no Arsenal captain Martin Odegaard who signed Simon Collins confirmed before the game was ill and therefore did not travel. Up stepped Fabio Vieira starting in back-to-back -back games and we need to talk about his assist. The perfect corner kick straight onto Saliba's head. Another example of Fabio Vieira's devastating final ball. He has now got 6 assists this season. That is the joint second highest in the team alongside Martin Odegaard and Gabriel Jesus. To do that in only 12 starts showcases the quality of Fabio Vieira and why Mikel Arteta is signing him. He may have some rough edges but his influence is definitely growing and I believe soon he's going to explode. But what about the centre forward Gabriel Martinelli completing 7 out of 9 dribbles. There was one standout dribble where he took on multiple Sporting Lisbon players. From his own half to the Sporting Lisbon box it was a fantastic solo run. Rounds the goalkeeper and nearly scores but Sporting were able to recover. If only he had chipped the goalkeeper we could have been talking about one of the goals of the year. I see a lot of promise in Martinelli's centre forward play but if he wants to level up there's one thing he needs to improve and that is keeping his head up when he's on the ball. Martinelli is a head down dribbler and often that works for him but as a centre forward it needs to be different. You need to have your head up to see the other options. And here's the prime example of Martinelli in one-on-one -on, -one on goal. His mind is to chip the goalkeeper where if his head was up he would have been able to see a clear Fabio Vieira, a simple square ball and it would have been Arsenal 2-1. In terms of finishing Martinelli is actually very decent with 11 goals from an XG of just 7.4, the fourth highest in the Premier League in terms of overperformance. He also has the creativity and with an expected assist of 5.98 he's only had two assists. Martinelli has a lot to his game and that's why I see so much 
much promise. But talk to me down below in the comments and do you believe he has a future as a centre forward? But what about Bukayo Saka playing on the right hand side? Well this guy was in a battle winning the most duels with 12 and completing the most take-ons with 8. I've seen a few fans criticise Mikel Arteta for overusing Bukayo Saka. I do agree in a sense that Arsenal need to sign a rotational right winger but if Bukayo Saka wants to be a top player he needs to be used to playing every 3 or 4 days. A lot of the top players that play in the Champions League are used to playing every Saturday and Wednesday and as Mikel Arteta says at this club you have to play every 3 days. You have to be fit and available to do it. If not it's not worth it. The Europa League may not be our priority but it's a fantastic opportunity for these Arsenal players to get used to playing in European football. Next year most likely in the Champions League there are no easy games and these guys will need to be ready. But to leave Lisbon with the draw I do believe it was a decent result. As Mikel Arteta says we learned some things and we could do better at the Emirates Stadium. I was very impressed by how Arsenal were able to control this game at 2-2. Mikel Arteta made some top subs. Tom Yasu, Gabriel and Partey all slowed the game down. In European football away games are always difficult. To leave with 2-2 is more than decent and as Mikel Arteta says we live we learn and let's finish the job at the Emirates Stadium. Moving on to the latest Arsenal news and starting off with the future of the Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta. He's done a very impressive job this year getting Arsenal in a title charge. It seems like he's caught the eyes on one of the biggest clubs in the world. As according to reports in Spain, Real Madrid are considering Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta as the club's next head coach. It looks like Real Madrid are moving past Carlo Ancelotti, so should Arsenal fans be worried? Well, Mikel Arteta says, I'm fully focused on what I'm doing here. I'm extremely happy, proud and grateful to be in this football club. And he also signed a brand new contract at the end of last season, so ultimately, I am not too worried. Yes, Real Madrid is a massive club, but at Arsenal, he's got a project, he's got a process. The backing of the Arsenal owners and the Arsenal fans. And we also can't forget he's a boyhood Barcelona fan. These reports are not a surprise though, because the John Mikel Arteta is doing at the Emirates is going to catch eyes. To have the second youngest team in the league fighting for a title, Mikel Arteta is not normal. And if he wins the league title, he would become the youngest manager to ever do so. Arsenal's future is very bright, and they have so many standout young players. And they have so many standout young players. Three of the four highest scoring players in Europe's top five leagues this season, age 21 or under, all play for Arsenal. Mikel Saka, Gabriel Martinelli, and following Balogun. With 15 league goals, Balogun keeps thriving in Liga. And alongside Kylian Mbappe, he's been nominated for the February League Earl Player of the Month. But what about his future going into next season? Well, in terms of the player himself, he's recently reposted a story which said that Balogun's going to be like a new signing for Arsenal next year. But we have Gabriel Jesus, we also have Eddie Nketiah. Do Arsenal have space for three strikers? According to Gary Jacobs, Balogun is unlikely to want to return to the club to be the third choice striker behind Eddie Nketiah. With other reports also claiming that Newcastle also have interest in signing Balogun. You've also got the likes of AC Milan and Inter Milan. Balogun's going to have options. But I believe his future is at the Emirates Stadium, especially in terms of next season. Arsenal are one of the best clubs in the world in developing young players. We have given opportunities to the likes of Bukayo Saka, Gabriel Martinelli and so many others. Why would it not be the same for following Balogun? Talking of strikers, let's talk Gabriel Jesus. With the massive news confirming that he's returned to full Arsenal training. Jesus is rising, he's nearly there. But when is he going to be available? Well, in terms of the game against Sporting Lisbon, reports have claimed Mikel Arteta made a late decision not to include Gabriel Jesus. The players camp expected him to go, but Arteta opted against it. As he says, we will try not to rush him back. Everything is going well, but he needs time to get his confidence and physical state to compete. Before he returns, he's going to need match sharpness, and that's where comes the Arsenal Academy. Maybe play a game or two there, and then return to the first team. And let's not forget, before the World Cup, he was on fire. In the Premier League, the most touches in the opposition box, second most take-ons attempted, second most duels won, second most fouls won, and a fourth most shots on target. Five goals and five assists, decent numbers there, but Jesus is more than goal contributions. This guy generates football. He causes mayhem in the final third. He makes the Arsenal attack better. And this graphic shows that with Jesus in the Arsenal team, we won more games, lost less games, scored more goals, and won more points. But clearly the drop-off's not been too bad. We're still sitting five points clear at the top of the league. To do that without your main striker, Arsenal deserves so much more credit. But one thing Jesus isn't is a clinical striker. And in terms of XG underperformance, both Eddie Nketiah and Gabriel Jesus are third and fourth in the league, both underperforming by nearly five goals. As effective as they have been, there is a question here to be asked. Should Arsenal add a different profile and a more ruthless striker? Well, that's where you've got Napoli's Victor Osimhen. This year with 19 goals and 21 league appearances, with an XG of only 14, this guy is a ruthless finisher. And the most impressive thing about those 19 goals is he scored zero penalties. And he wants to play in the Premier League. As he says, I'm working so hard to make sure that I achieve my dream of playing in the Premier League someday. But like I said, it's a process and I just want to keep on this momentum and continue to do well at Napoli. He's
is out of contract in 2025 and certainly has a lot of suitors. And according to Italian journalist Ciro Venerato, for now the big clubs only speak with the entourage of the striker. The Premier League remains Arsenal favourites, Man United Chelsea duel with a high bar set for its price tag. When you've got so much potential and you're only 24 years of age, Napoli are going to want big, big money. Napoli's president De Laurentiis is asking for 150 million euros. Top of the Serie A and fighting in the Champions League, Napoli are in a very good moment. Osimhen is one of their star players and their president is known to be a stern negotiator. Aurelio De Laurentiis has a history of being difficult. Fabrizio Romano has been speaking. He says Arsenal have been with Victor Osimhen, but I don't have it confirmed as of now. Arsenal have Gabriel Jesus, Eddie Nketiah, following Balogun and also Osimhen's price tag will be really huge. I think Arsenal have different priorities for the summer, including a new midfielder. Arsenal have plenty of options and you've also got the returning following Balogun. The only way I see Arsenal signing Osimhen is if they were to sell someone. Arsenal instead have midfield priorities and as Fabrizio Romano says, Arsenal are convinced they got an excellent deal with Jorginho, but they will try to sign a new midfielder this summer. And that's where we need to talk about Brighton's World Cup winning Alexis McAllister. According to a T1 reporter out of Argentina, Arsenal and Chelsea are the two most interesting clubs in signing Alexis McAllister. The player is expected to leave Brighton this summer. I truly believe this guy's profile is perfect for the left side of the Arsenal midfield. And in terms of price tags, according to Ben Jacobs, a price of around 60 million euros plus is likely to be enough to sign the player. In the current market, that's not even that expensive. Ultimately, he's a different profile to what Arsenal have. And the game against Sports in Lisbon showed, Arsenal need more players that are comfortable playing out of the press. McAllister is a fantastic dribbler, completing 76% of his dribbles. In the current market, I can't think of a better number 8 profile, but there might be someone else available. This one's controversial, Chelsea's Mason Mount. And Fabrizio Romano confirms the feeling is that there's a real chance that Mason Mount can leave Chelsea at the end of the season. Chelsea are trying to extend his contract, but so far they have been unsuccessful. As Jacob Steenberg says, Mason Mount could be available for £50 million, and it's increasingly likely that he leaves Chelsea, whose latest contract offer was understood to be worth £180,000 a week. It's a lot of money, but in the current market, he's Premier League proven and 24 years of age. This year's not been his year, but last year he was very decent, with 11 league goals. Reports have claimed the likes of Liverpool have interest. I think Mason Mount has recently been misprofiled at Chelsea, and his best was definitely under Thomas Tuchel, and he even assisted the winning goal in the Champions League final. It's controversial, it's out there, but talk to me down below in the comments. If Mason Mount's available, should Arsenal make a move? Moving on to the other Arsenal news today. All the eyes turn to the massive game on Sunday, Fulham at Craven Cottage. It's first against seventh, and Fulham have been in decent form, winning three out of their last five games. In comparison, Arsenal are five games unbeaten, winning four. And they also have the best away record in the Premier League, but this game will be far from easy. Having drawn the likes of Liverpool and beaten the likes of Chelsea, Craven Cottage is not an easy place to go to. And at that place, Fulham are unbeaten in four games. In goal, Fulham have an ex-Arsenal player in Burnt Leno. His form has been fantastic and he's prevented 6.9 goals this season, the second most in the league. But their standout player has definitely been Jao Paulinho, who in the league has won the most duels and made the most tackles. But the great news for Arsenal is that he is going to be unavailable, who was suspended after picking up his 10th booking of the season. Whereas in terms of Arsenal, there's still no Mohamed Elneny. And in terms of Leandro Trossard, reports have claimed he's out at least until the international break. You also have Martin Odegaard and Kieran Tierney unavailable for the game against Sporting Lisbon via illness, but it looks like they're going to be available. For Gabriel Jesus, it may be too soon, but Eddie Nketiah may be available. With that kept in mind, I believe Arsenal will line up with a standard 4-3-3 with Ramsdale on goal, a back four of Ben White, William Saliba, Gabriel and Zinchenko, a midfield three of Partey, Jack and Odegaard, and a front three of Reese Nelson, Gabriel Martinelli and Bukayo Saka. Marco Silva has made Fulham a very hard team to beat, and as we saw at the Emirates Stadium, they are well organised and they can cause issues, but Arsenal have the quality and it's a massive game for the title race. And in terms of the title race, you've also got another team trying to be a part of it, and that's Manchester United, as reports claim that in the Man United players WhatsApp group chat, they had spoken about the prospect of catching up the top two, before losing 7-0 to Liverpool. The humbling their fans and players deserved, this is a two-horse race. Arsenal against Man City, and in terms of City, they played before Arsenal in a massive game against Crystal Palace away from home, where over the years they have dropped some points, and hopefully Patrick Vieira and Albert Sambi Lukonga can do something special. But as things stands, Arsenal are still five points clear top of the league, with 63 points. As the stats show here, Arsenal and City are going neck and neck. These are by far the two top teams in the league. And here's a fantastic stat. Man City's previous points tally after 20 
26 games, ranging from 54 to 63 points. Right now, Arsenal have the same amount of points as City's best over the past years, and we are only a few wins away from equaling our entire points tally from all of last season. But all focus is on Marco Silva's Fulham. It won't be easy, but if you're trying to win a title, it's a game that Arsenal simply have to win. But that is the video there and there, so hopefully you guys have enjoyed. If you have, don't forget to smash a like and also subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you want to follow your boy in all of the social medias, then the links are down below in the description. But that was all of today's latest Arsenal news and after a draw in Lisbon, all eyes to Craven Cottage. Arsenal have a job to do and hopefully they can do it. I will see you next time. Take care and good bits.